an introduction to quantitative evaluation of minerals uh, in the SEM. Uh, these days, it's sometimes referred to as uh, automated quantitative mineralogy or AQM as a more generic term as well. Uh, I'm based at the ANU in Canberra, where I am a um, operations manager of the Centre for Advanced Microscopy. My experience is, main, is mainly in the physical sciences, uh, specifically solid state chemistry, physics, and I've also um, done a, quite a bit of work in, uh, in the mineralogy, uh, or analytical mineralogy. Um, so, uh, okay, my slide is not advancing for some reason. There we go. Um, so by the end of this presentation, you should have a, 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 at least a basic understanding of what I mean by what a QEM scan is, what I mean by that, uh, how it works, and also a little bit more about what it can do. Uh, so you have a problem, you have a sample, it could be a mineral, or it could be some sort of uh, articles, uh, particulates, and you want to know more about them. You may want to know mineral content, uh, mineral texture, phase association, mineral distribution, particle size, porosity, any of those things, uh, basically to characterize your sample. So some of the techniques you uh, have available to you would be uh, XRD. Uh, Generally, that is more of a bulk analysis technique. You don't really have the spatial information, how the minerals are associated with each other, for instance. Also, you don't get any uh, chemistry. Um, optical uh, ap approaches can give you the mineral phase ID. It has limited uh, resolution though, so you tend to have problems when you get to the smaller particulars in the micron size range. Uh, of course, you can also use conventional SEM, uh, either EDS or WDS, but then you're really looking, you tend to look at individual analysis and you do uh, point by point analysis. So it tends to be slow and you have limited 2D data available to you. So uh, back in the 70s, a, uh, at the CSIRO in Australia, uh, a guy called Paul Gottlieb, uh, wanted to develop a technique which would speed up um, the process for characterizing uh, minerals, especially for mineral in the mineral processing field. So his idea was he wanted to use an SEM, but he put uh, equipped with two to four EDS detectors to basically speed up the overall acquisition rate. He also automated the acquisition process and, and the subsequent um, processing of the data. Um, you still need a flat polished sample, so you, you do need to do some sample prep. It doesn't just apply to uh, rough samples. So um, having created the system, an SEM with multiple detectors, uh, high count rate, so how does it work? Uh, so the idea is that we put the sample in the SEM. I have a backscattered image here of the sample, and I've shown you the area that I want mapped here, or certainly that is within one scan. So what, what it does is it, it steps the beam at each point and collects a, a spectrum. Um, and it does that at very high count rates. So with multiple detectors, uh, you can achieve count rates of 400,000 uh, to 800,000 million counts a second. It depends a little bit on your system, our system, uh, we have two detectors and we routinely achieve count rates in excess of 400,000 counts per second at 10 nanoamps. So we collect the spectrum, we save that spectrum, we step the beam, collect another spectrum. It requires about two to eight milliseconds. Again, depends on, the, uh, on how many counts you want to accumulate in each spectrum. In, in my case, I tend to uh, accumulate about 3,000 counts in each spectrum, then move on to the next point. So you keep doing that and you store those spectra in, a, uh, in an array, if you like. Now, 
the system is clever enough to recognize when it reaches uh, areas of little or no interest. So typically that would be, say, when it hits some resin or it hits a void, and it uses the backscatter signal uh, to determine at which point uh, an area is of no, of no interest. So typically resin and voids are very low in uh, brightness. So we set a threshold to determine at which point we do not want to collect any, uh, any X-ray data. So at that point, it, it, it stops collecting uh, until it steps the beam and hits another part of the sample uh, that is of, um, of interest. So it continues on collecting data in that way uh, until it's finished that particular field of view or that's, that scan. Now, uh, the, the, the scan deflection is, it has to be limited because if you used to deflect the beam too far, you tend to lose, start losing count at uh, the edges of your field. So we can only typically scan about one and a half millimeters or less at any one time. So if we want to cover a larger area, we need to move the, beam, uh, move the sample and collect the next tile. We move the sample, collect the next tile, until we finish the entire area of interest that we want to do. So uh, typically the maps are overlapped, so we can stitch them all into a single uh, X-ray map, if you like. Um, and um, we can work with the whole map as one. Now, uh, before I move on to how we then identify minerals, um, you have to appreciate that acquisition time can be an issue because uh, this graph is meant to represent uh, what your resolution is and that's determined by how closely, uh, how, cl how what your step size is of the, uh, as you step the beam across the sample. So uh, if you step it, if you want to, you, you might say, okay, I want to do it at one micron. Well, if you scan an area of two by, if you collect a, an area of two by four centimeters, you're collecting uh, 850 million pixels. That's what it takes to cover that particular area at one micron. Or it would take 1,100 hours. So it's probably not going to be practical for you to do that. If you drop it to five microns, the number of pixels drops to 34 million, and you're starting to get into something that is probably achievable, but it still takes close to two days. Uh, 10 microns, uh, 10 hours, 15 microns, four, four and a half hours, uh, and 20 microns that you can do it within um, uh, two or three hours. So uh, you may want to be realistic in what you can achieve uh, in a given time and also, uh, well, how much you can afford to pay. I mean, we can map for a long time, but how much money do you want to spend? Because it, you will have to pay for the time. Um, so uh, what you can do is, of course, you can take a... a uh, low resolution overview and maybe concentrate on some specific areas where you want, want to do some high resolution uh, 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 maps. Okay, so uh, you need to be careful in terms of what acquisition conditions you want to uh, use. Um, so now how does the mineral identification work once you have a, a map? So there are a number of uh, ways that various companies achieve this. Some of them, uh, they don't all use the same approach. Some of them use derived peak intensities. Um, others use a combination of uh, uh, spectral matching and image processing. Uh, the way we do it here is we just do, uh, we do, we do spectral matching. So that's what I'm going to be talking about, but this is not the only approach that can be used. Um, so in the technique that I'm referring to, we, we have a library of compounds or uh, minerals. And for each mineral or compound, we have a reference spectrum and, uh, we assign a color according to each, uh, each mineral. So here's our library. There's only uh, three, element, uh, three, uh, three minerals in this library for simplicity. And typically this is chosen from a much larger library of uh, compounds that's available um, in, in, within the software. So the idea is that you actually tell it which minerals you want to look for before you start doing uh, 
during the post-processing. So on the left here, we have our unknown, which is a single spectrum out of your 20, 30 million uh, spectra that you've collected. And what it does is it tries to match uh, the spectra in your library to, to that unknown. So here I've shown you, uh, I've overlaid the attempt to match anhydride to this spectrum, and it only has a spectral match of 3.4%. So um, the spectral match is a way of achieving, okay, when do I tell it it fits and when it doesn't? So usually that can be from zero to 100% fit. 100% fit is a perfect fit. In this case, we only have a 3.4% match. Now, um, the soft, in the software itself, we usually set a, uh, a spectral match threshold, which is typically not 100%. It, it's typically when maybe when you do your first uh, run, you might set it at um, high 80s, low 90s, something like that, so that you allow some, uh, a slight amount of mismatch. In this case, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate it set at 90%. So the threshold is set at 90% match. Uh, if I now go to appetite, uh, we're gonna, we again get a spectral match and it's only 6.9%, well below the 90% required. We go to our final entry in our library and we get a much higher match and, and you can sort of already visualize that it's a pretty good match and it's matching at 96.7%. So that's above our threshold. So in this case, this would be considered to be a match and that pixel would be colored the color according to the mineral that it's uh, matched with. So this, in this case, that pixel would be colored blue, the light blue. Um, and so we go on and process the entire map and we end up with a, uh, a mineral map according uh, and, and, a, and a legend uh, where the color uh, in the map is associated with uh, a mineral in, in, the, in this case. Um, now, uh, some, some more, uh, I, want, I want to cover some, some potential problems that you may have uh, in your map, uh, which you may not be aware of. So this is an example where um, I, I want you to concentrate on the grain that I've highlighted in the red there, where I appear to have uh, quite a good match. Uh, here's the grain again, and I've got a match of 92%, so it's above my 90% threshold, but if you have a careful look at the spectrum that it's matching with, you can see that the magnesium to silicon ratio seems to be a little bit off, and in fact, it's completely ignoring iron, but yet you still get a 92% 90 match. Um, the issue here is that basically you've omitted a, a mineral from your library. Uh, and so, because there is another, other, there are other minerals in this case with a very similar comp composition. So, in this case, we have a mineral called forsterite, which is uh, an olivine type of olivine, which has, a, if you look at the composition, magnesium, uh, a lot of magnesium and silicon, similar to the ensatite grain here, magnesium silicon. It also has some iron, though, uh, but more importantly, the magnesium to iron ratio is a little bit higher than the enzatide. So if I try and do a match with that, you'll find in fact that I get close to a 99% match. So now if you include that in your library, it will always go for the best match above whatever you set as a, as a threshold. So if I now include uh, this olivine phosphorite into my library and reprocess this map, you'll find that now it will actually pick it up correctly and I've added another uh, 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 mineral to my legend. So you need to be aware uh, that you have in fact identified the mineralogy in your sample, uh, perhaps through XRD or other methods before you start, or you typically you know a little bit about yourself. So uh, it doesn't just simply identify every, all the minerals um, if you don't give it the right information in the first place. Right, so now there's a few other things going on with this particular map, and I'd like you to concentrate on some of the grains that I've highlighted here. Now, this is quite subtle, and you don't necessarily realize what's going on, but I just wanted to point out what else you might be able to do. Um, 
Now, this is actually correctly identified as a feldspar. Um, feldspars are, um, or K feldspar, albite, and northite are all part of a feldspar series. And if I look at how well it did the fitting in these particular grains, what you actually see here is that this is a spectral match image. So where we can see the spectral match in terms of a grayscale, so white would be a perfect match. And as we go towards black, at black you're also already dropping off close to um, in the high 80s or 90s. So what you can see is there's clearly there's, uh, even though we matched it, um, there is clearly a little bit of variation in the chemistry where the match is going off a little bit. So if we look in the brighter area where the match is 98, 99%, and we then we compare that to what's happening in the darker area where the mineral match has dropped off to 90 or to 93%, still within our um, match threshold, but you can sort of see that the reason why it's not matching quite as well is because it's actually starting to change the chemistry bit a bit. So we, we now see sodium, uh, which wasn't in the brighter regions, and also the aluminium and silicon ratio is a little bit off. So what you have to realize here is that variation is there is because not all minerals are a single composition. Um, and uh, we're trying to match it to a single composition. And in fact, the composition is changing a little bit as, as we go through this, uh, step through this grain. So what's happening here is that um, this particular mineral, uh, northite, which is what we matched it to, is part of the entire feldspar series. And if we look towards the left here, we have uh, another member, which is called albite, which has sodium and it has uh, less aluminium and it has a bit more silicon. So the aluminium to silicon ratio is changing as we go from, as we substitute um, uh, calcium and aluminium for silicon uh, and, um, and sodium. So uh, if we now allow the system to create a solid solution by looking at spectra from both end members, so this is a spectrum for albite, this is a spectrum for pure uh, anorthite. If we allow them to, uh, to mix to actually correspond to the pore fitting spectrum, so if we take 75% uh, anorthite and mix that with 25% albite and then create the mixed spectrum, you can immediately see that we have a much better match to what we uh, initially was a pore fitting spectrum. So if we now include uh, the system to allow a solid solution between these two end member phases, then what will happen is that we, we now have allowed a solid solution here between albite and northite. You can actually see that, you can actually see the, the variation in the, the feldspar grain uh, in the actual image. So we can see that the um, brighter regions are northite and uh, as we go to the darker regions, we're mixing in some albite. So the color that's picked is it's basically a mix of colors between the two uh, end members. Okay, so you can actually see zoning in your crystal. So that may be important because it may tell you something about the, the history of that particular uh, crystal. Okay, um, so what can you do uh, once you've correctly identified the mineralogy? So I have a, uh, one of the things you can do is you can look for trace, uh, trace mineral search, trace compound search. So here's a backscattered image. I'm looking for, say, zircon. Now I can look at, zircon has got, generally got higher atomic numbers, so I can try individual analysis and try and look for which one might be zircon. If I've done a quem map, zircon will appear, which I've done here, uh, zircon will appear as a red, well, the trouble is it's a bit difficult to find that in this particular map. So what I can do is I can simply only show zircon. And so now you can clearly see that, well, if you look carefully, you can see a single pixel there. There's a smaller particle there. And there's a couple of other single pixel in the, in the highlighted circles. So it's capable of finding almost, well, single pixels, uh, in, in over 350,000 pixels, which are in this single tile. 
uh, or map, sorry. Uh, so it's quite sensitive uh, or in terms of picking up trace, uh, trace minerals. Uh, and the area fraction uh, is only 0.006% uh, in this case. Uh, the other thing it can do is it can do uh, modal fractions where it looks at the minerals that you identified and it will determine how much area they each uh, occupy. So uh, here the feldspar occupy uh, close to 50% of, of this particular field of view. Pyroxene, another 41, 42%. Um, often you find there may be some unclassified where we're actually having trouble identifying uh, the mineralogy due to perhaps some surface roughness. Uh, or there can also be some uh, 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 mixtures, uh, mixed phases along uh, mineral boundaries. Uh, we can also report that in terms of uh, weight percent values because we know the um, the density uh, uh, of, the, of the materials. So we can actually determine, uh, give you an estimate of the weight percent composition, uh, contribution. Um, the other thing we can do is if anyone's done any uh, X-ray CT data, uh, this can be mixed in with the X-ray CD data. Uh, we basically match it to a slice, the same slice in the X-ray uh, CT set, and we can then derive uh, volume fractions as well. Um, right, uh, so if you're, if you're now scanning uh, a, a sample with lots of particles, we can, uh, we can categorize the particles in terms of their size distribution uh, and chemistry, changes in uh, mineralogy. Uh, we combine that with a uh, particle size distribution. Once we know uh, those two, uh, we can also, have, knowing the uh, uh, mineral distribution, we can decide if we're interested in recovering a particular ore, we can, we can determine how much of that ore is actually uh, present as free particles. So there's no uh, secondary phase or very little secondary phase. At the moment, that's free is defined as uh, if 95% of its area is, is actually due or of interest, then that's considered free. If, uh, if it's within 80 to 95%, it's considered liberated. There's a few other uh, terminologies here, but uh, if it's below 20%, it, it's generally considered locked. And what that's telling you is that you may want to do some further grinding to liberate that particular ore. So if we combine all that information, we can do, uh, produce plots like this, where the mineral fraction is plotted against the, uh, the amount of the ore that we have uh, in the sample versus the degree of liberation for that particular uh, particle size. So uh, we can do that for a range of particle sizes. So we can then basically do that for a particle size distribution. And we can decide then maybe how best to proceed with uh, recovery of that mineral through flotation processes or um, or other means so that we can optimize the recovery process and we can get some idea of uh, what the efficiency is going to be given a certain uh, process. Um, so hopefully I've been able to show you that uh, a better or give you a better idea of what QuemScan is, how it works uh, and what it can do and certainly that it's a, a powerful SEM based technique uh, for uh, evaluation of minerals as well as, well as other uh, solid materials. Um, uh, I'd like to conclude it there. Thank you for listening. Uh, and I'll take any questions uh, if you like. Thank you very much.